I want to welcome you back to the second day of Black Hat. So far, it's been a pretty good success. The uh, problems we had at lunch will be, I am told, corrected. We'll have double the flow rate, whatever that means when it comes to humans. Um, we'll see what that's all about today. But uh, before we kick this off, I want to perform a little informal uh, survey. How many people went to bed before midnight last night? Ah, we're all growing old. Okay, how many people before two? Okay, that's, that's, that was the, maybe the sweet spot on the bell curve of partyage. How many people uh, haven't gone to sleep yet? <laughs> ah, I see one guy back there leaning against the wall with a coffee in his hand. Cool. Okay, so you guys know before you leave today, you're supposed to give me some feedback uh, so we can keep this guy tuned up and on track. So please turn it in. We give away some free admissions to uh, future black hats uh, out of random drawing. So it's not just all altruistic. We uh, actually do give you some uh, cash prizes, sort of. And uh, how many people saw the Pony Awards last night? Yeah, what do you think? Do that thing again next year, right? Yeah, that was cool. OK, so our next guest needs no introduction. But I'll give him one anyway, right? <laughs> Bruce Schneier. <clears throat> it's become a, a security icon, and it's kind of funny because when any time a reporter asks me what I think of what Bruce has said, I just say, what he said. He's so uh, fantastically reasonable and well-spoken. He seems to summarize complex ideas and portray them in pretty simple terms, and uh, I think that's a really important skill because the industry needs someone who can take what we do, compress it down, and uh, convey it in a very simple uh, you know, and logical manner that's kind of devoid of emotional swings. And so the work Bruce is going to be presenting today I think is really fascinating uh, you know, on how the human mind perceives and values risk, you know, can do risk uh, trade-offs. And because of that, I'm going to sit in this room the whole time and watch Bruce. So come on up here, Bruce, and knock him down. So I think if, you, uh, if you're going to ask people how late they're partying, you need to normalize for time zone. Because right? if you're from Europe and you party till midnight, that's actually really good. But if you're from California, less good. So I'm going to talk about the psychology of security. I've been, uh, I sort of consider my career an endless series of generalizations. I uh, recently started looking at uh, the, uh, the Kavi around security. Is, my, is the mic gone? Yeah. Is that better? They promised me. All right. We're not going to use the lavalier. We'll use... Go, I'm going back to this microphone. Whoever you are. Okay, good. Okay. No, no problem. Hang on. I just got to rearrange a little bit. So recently, I've been looking at the context around security. I've done a lot of work in the economics of security and how security products and services fail or succeed in the marketplace for reasons that have really nothing to do with technology. And more recently, I've started looking at the psychology of security and you know, how we perceive security and how we think about security and how we make security decisions. Uh, it's surprisingly oh, two things. One is there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, there's stuff from uh, brain science. I mean, they'll put people in MRI scanners and ask them security questions or put them in stressful situations and see what parts of the brain light up. There's a whole lot of psychological studies about risk and security and trade-offs and costs. I'm doing a lot of, a lot of that here. Uh, there's an entire journal of risk studies put out by psychologists. I mean, who knew? Right? There's uh, evolutionary biology looking at how we as a species evolved to handle security threats, because if you think about it, security is very fundamental to, to being alive, you know, whether you're a single cell organism or a, or a higher mammal. And a lot of this is all coming together. And I think there's a lot for us to learn as security technologists about how the brain works and how security works. Because right, if you think about it, security is both a feeling and a reality. Right? And they're different. You could feel secure even if you're not secure. 
and you know at the same time, well, I guess a different time, you can be secure even though you don't feel it. Right? In in some sense, there are two different words. Right? Two different meanings of the same word. And that makes it hard. It makes it hard to talk about this. And what I'm going to talk about here really is just about the feeling of security. It has nothing to do with the reality. Right? Only about how we perceive security. Now, I've been saying for, for a long time, for years I've been writing this, security is a trade-off. Right? Fundamentally, I guess a good way to think of it is you're a security consumer. You spend something, right? money, convenience, time, civil liberties, capabilities, and you get some security in return. Right? And the question they ask is, is it worth it? The wrong question is, does the security do any good? Because even if it does, you might not use it if it's not worth it. I mean, a good example is a bulletproof vest. Right? They actually work pretty well, but you know, I'll lay odds that nobody in this room is wearing it. Hmm, you know, maybe a couple of weirdos. Right? <laughs> not because they don't work. But because of the, uh, the cost in money and lack of fashion sense, it, it, it's not worth it. And that's true for home burglar alarms. That's true for invading Iraq. I mean, any security trade-off. Is the cost worth the benefit? Right? And people have a natural intuition about these trade-offs. Right? You make these security trade-offs every day. Right? In simple things, when you decide whether you're going, you know, what kind of hygiene regime you're going to do in the morning, or whether you walk down this street or that street, or double lock your hotel room door in the night, are you making these security trade offs? And everybody does it. We do it dozens of times a day. Every species does it. Right? Imagine a rabbit in a field eating grass. The rabbit sees a fox. The rabbit's going to make a security trade off. Should I stay or should I flee? And the rabbits that are good at that trade off will tend to reproduce, and the rabbits that are bad at it will get eaten or starve. So you'd think that we, as a successful species on the planet, would be really good at these trade-offs. At the same time, we're hopelessly bad at it, and to me, that's what's interesting. And I'll sort of give you the, I'll give you the short answer now. We, at, we humans are really, really good at making security trade-offs endemic to living in small family groups in the East African highlands in 100,000 BC. We're great at that. 2007 New York City, not so much. But, I mean, that, that's, that's the quick answer. This will be the long answer. So there are five aspects of the security trade-off I'm going to look at. And these sort of places where we as humans might get it wrong. Right? We might misunderstand the severity of the risk. Right? If we think the risk is more or less than it actually is, we're going to get the trade-off wrong. The probability, and how likely is it to happen to us? If we get that wrong, we're going to get the trade-off wrong. We might get the costs wrong. We might under or overestimate the costs. Right? We might misunderstand the countermeasure. How good is it? Right? How good is that door lock? How good is that burglar alarm? Right? If we respond to uh, a deceitful advertisement, we might get the trade-off wrong. And lastly, the trade-off itself. We just might make a bad trade-off even though we have all the pieces. So those are sort of the five things I'm going to touch on. All right, but first, so this is your brain on security. That, that little red thing is called the amygdala. The amygdala is one of the oldest parts of your brain. It, it first appeared in primitive fishes. And it is the part of the brain that controls the fight or flight. So things like uh, sweaty palms and adrenaline and uh, increased heart rate, increased muscle tension, you know, all of that comes out of the amygdala. Actually, that, that's, an, that's a lie. Whenever someone tells you this is the part of the brain where this happens, they are lying to you. I mean, basically, everything sort of tends to happen everywhere, but things tend to also tend to be localized. So the amygdala is the place where that happens, but things also happen elsewhere. One of the things I'm going to do in this talk is convince you forever that your brain is nothing like a computer, not even a teeny tiny bit. Right? Things don't happen in this one place. But the amygdala is the seat of this, this fight or flight. It's interesting. It is a very, very fast part of your brain. It is faster than consciousness. If, if I show you a picture of something you have a phobia of, a snake, your amygdala will kick in before your conscious brain knows what it's seeing. Right? The amygdala is faster than consciousness. 
uh, it can be overridden, right? I mean, one of the neat things about being a primate is we get a lot of other brain that can uh, counteract this. But it's not easy. I mean, lots of research is done here uh, by groups studying policemen and firemen and soldiers, trying to get them to basically to override their amygdala, to try to reason in a situation where basically their reptile brain is kicking in. A lot of studies done there. This is your neocortex. Right? This is what you get because you're a mammal. You, yours is nice and big because you're a human. Uh, the neocortex is the part of the mammalian brain associated with consciousness. So this is where thinking and reasoning happens. And, and you know, it's believed it, was, it first showed up because uh, because mammals and then primates had, had to deal with very complex social interactions. You also see it, uh, the uh, big uh, neocortex in, in some species of bats that have very complex social hierarchies. Uh, it is, like I said, the newest part of the brain. I mean, the way to think of it is it's still in beta testing, right? It works as testament by, you know, all of us that the bike's down again. Are we good now? Yes, someone, someone in the back has to nod. No one in the back is nodding. Mike. Ah! All right. All right. This will be fixed by sometime. Okay. So, <laughs> this, this is the slowest part of the brain. Right? This is the part of the brain that will react last to things. And, you know, it, it's the part of the brain that's, that's most computer-like, but it's also very much not like a computer. It uses a whole lot of, I mean, you see them called heuristics, right? brain heuristics. Uh, think of them as rules of thumb. Think of them as cognitive biases. I mean, basically shortcuts. You know, we don't have the full logical programming, but we tend to have shortcuts. We have lots of them. And they basically work. Right? And there are some basic ones. Right? When you see two dots in a line, you see face. That is a cognitive shortcut because seeing faces is important to us, so we quickly recognize them, and that will spill over to even recognizing things that aren't faces. And that's the way to think of, of these brain heuristics. They work really well, but they fail sometimes. And a lot of security problems happen when these, these biases fail. So here's uh, some common sense about risks. And I've collected these from about seven or eight different sources. And it's all how people exaggerate and downplay risk. I started writing about this in, uh, I started writing about it in, in Secrets and Lies in, in 2000, and wrote about it in Beyond Fear, and this is an even bigger list. And, you know, and I really wasn't understanding why we had these when I was writing that. I was just saying, like, here's what they are. Right? And, you know, and there's some examples, right? We, we exaggerate rare risks and downplay common risks, right? Flying versus driving. Uh, we, uh, we exaggerate risks against our children. You know, and when you look at these lists, it, it, what's interesting to me about them is they basically make a lot of sense, right? They're not weird. I mean, you can understand why we might exaggerate certain risks and downplay others. I mean, of course we would exaggerate risks against our children because our children are our genetic offspring. So if we don't do that, we're going to have less children, we're going to die. Now, you know, you, you're going to exagger, exaggerate the spectacular and rare. Just because you don't, you know, your sense of probability at the high end falls apart. And something that's common, you'll downplay because it's common and you have to live with it. You learn to live with it. So let's, uh, let's talk about some of that. And when, when you hear about, I'm going I'm to give you a whole lot of, of sort of psychological studies. Think about these. Think about these uh, different brain heuristics. And at the end, I'm going to give you all a URL for a, a write-up of a lot of this stuff so you can not take detailed notes. All right, so let's do, let's do some experiments. And these are all, a lot of these experiments have been repeated, especially the more common ones. This is an interesting one. This is looking at how we deal with risk. A lot of the studies are, are financial in nature. So here's an example site. This, this is a very common the way, a way these sorts of studies will be, will be set up. We'll divide you into two groups, or you'll be one group and you'll be the other group. And this group will give you a choice. I mean, so you, it, it's, this, is a, this is basically a survey question. And you choose between... $500 or a 50% chance of $1,000. Right? And you choose 
between losing $500 or a 30% loss of $1,000? In some ways, this is a very Vegas type of a survey. <laughs> right? And, and you'd expect, and I'm sure you can ask you know, anybody who runs games in Vegas, and they'll tell you that some people are risk-averse and some people are risk-seeking. Right? And the gamblers among you will tend to take the risk, and the non-gamblers among you will tend to you know, take the sure thing. Right? The expected value is the same, but you know, sort of whether you're risk-seeking or risk-averse. The data actually doesn't bear that out. Right? 84% of us will take the sure gain, and 70% of us will take the risky loss. So we are risk-averse when it comes to gains and risk-seeking when it comes to losses. Right? In economic models, this fundamentally makes no sense. This is unexpected. And when, when this showed up, the economists were sort of livid. I mean, li they've recovered. And there's something called behavioral economics, which takes this stuff into account. But it took a good 20, 30 years before you know, the rational economic man was banished. Now, if you think about it evolutionarily, it, it, it sort of makes sense. Right? You know, a sure, if we are a species at the edge of survival, which most species are, Right? A sure gain, even though it's small, means you, you live to another day. Right? A big meal versus a small meal. You take the small meal now. Don't risk the big meal because you might get nothing. Right? On the other hand, if you're looking at losses, the sure loss is going to mean you're going to lose. But the risky loss means you might not. So you can see how a species would develop with this sort of thing. And there have been studies that have confirmed this, although not the same way, in, in other man laboratory rats which I think is, is really cool. So here's another study. You'll see this. This is called the Asian disease experiment. Uh, again, we're going to ask you all to imagine a disease. You know, so you're, you're preparing for an outbreak of a disease that will kill 600 people, like everyone in this room. And again, we'll divide into two groups. You will get to choose between two different remediation programs. Program A, 200 people will be saved. Program B, there's a one-third chance that everybody is saved and a two-third chance that nobody is saved. And you'll make that choice. And then you guys will give, will give C and D. You choose between a program where 400 people will die or a choice where there's a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-thirds probability that everybody will die. Okay? Now, unlike the previous study, those two groups are the exact same thing. It's just phrased differently. The top half is phrased in terms of lives saved. The bottom half is phrased in terms of lives lost. They are exactly the same choice. But you still see the bias. Right? Phrased in terms of a, a, of a win, 72% take the sure win. Phrased in terms of a loss, 78% take the risky loss. This has huge consequences in how doctors describe medical treatments to people among other things. And this really shows the bias, right? This is just the bias. You know, we're not seeing anything else. And this has been repeated dozens of times. This has been repeated across cultures. You know, these are not anomalous results, because the first thing you look at is say, that's, that's ridiculous. Does this man have a note for me? Turn off cell phone if you have one. It's over there, even though, all right. You know, it's, it's time is short. I should hold up a sign saying, cell phone is turned off now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's, here's another experiment. Something called an endowment effect. Uh, basically, we are, once we get something, we kind of feel like we own it. And, and here's some two spare experiments that illustrate that. Uh, Actually, let me tell you about some of these. If you start reading enough of these psychological surveys, you realize two things. One, the typical, the typical subject of one of these surveys is a college student. And the typical prop for one of these surveys, surveys is something you can buy in a college bookstore. Right, so here's one of them. It's the, called the mug experiment. We will take a bunch of you and give half of you a mug. Here, it's yours to keep. And then we will ask you, those who have a mug, how much would you willing to sell it back to me for? Right? And then we will ask those of you who don't have a mug, how much would you willing to buy the mug for? 
Right? Normal economics says there's, there's, some norm, there's some price of this value for this mug, and you guys will hit some normal distribution around it. Uh, it turns out that actually doesn't happen at all. The selling price is about twice the asking price. As soon as I give you something, you value it twice as much, just by the virtue of you having it within seconds. This has been replicated with expensive things also. Actually, two things have been done. Because a lot of these studies have been criticized. Well, it's a mug. It costs three bucks. Who cares? And, and two things have been done. Uh, there was one study where someone got funding to do this with, with large amounts of money, with hundreds of dollars, you know, for, for only a few people to see if it matched, and it did. And someone else had the bright idea. So let's go to some third world country where $5 is a lot of money, and, and we'll do it there. And the results were consistent. So this is not based on small amounts. Second experiment, which is similar, is the pen mug experiment. We'll give half of you a pen and half of you a mug. And then we will ask you, do you want to trade? And again, you'd think there'd be some normalized ratio of the value of the pen to the mug, and there'll be some bell curve, right? And the same percentage of people will want to keep a pen is as the same number of people who want to trade a mug for a pen, because the mug has sort of that relative value. That's not what happens. Most people don't change. Right? I give it to you and you suddenly prefer it. And you can survey people beforehand and ask them, would you prefer the pen or the mug? The Is the mic down again? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll work. Are we uh, good now? Excellent. So th there are other heuristics that show up is that we have an optimism bias. We tend to believe that bad things won't happen to us. Right? Bad things happen to other people. A lot of times this shows up. There's a control bias. We tend to believe that things under our control are less likely to, to do damage. A lot of this is, you know, everybody is a better than our average driver kind of thing. Right? There's an illusion of control when we're driving so we feel it's safer than it is. And risks involving people. There, there's a great study I saw. Is it down again? All right. Bad. This is going to play hell with the recording. Uh, there's a, uh, a study was done where uh, subjects were given a survey about risks in a national park. And there were three types of risks. There were natural risks, like you know, mudslides and landslides. There were animal-based risks, bears. And there were people-based risks. Right, you know, muggings and, and other, other people attacking. And the subjects were asked how much to spend on mitigating the various risks. And even when the data they were given showed that things like bears or, or natural disasters were much more common, much more prevalent. I mean, the data was made up, which is sort of to see how people would react. They would always spend disproportionately more on the people-based risks. That people-based risks are, are, are really considered bad. And people worry about them much more than they worry about natural risks. So there's one study that showed that. Now I'm going to do a bunch of heuristics about probability. Yeah. Are you talking to me? <laughs> Should I do something, not do something? All right. Here, let's, uh, let's use one of the wires. All right. This is one of the wires. Yeah, it's maybe got a bad cable or something. All right, you think we can put this here? Here. Yeah, let's get it over. We need a bigger podium. Okay. All right, so rumor has it this will be better. So I want to, I want to talk about a problem. So, so as you can see at home, this is the new setup. See, new mic. <laughs> talk about probabilities. Uh, we're not good at probabilities. I mean, you know, the joke of one, two, three, many is actually vaguely right. You know, and it makes sense. I mean, between one mango and three mangoes matters, but you know, a thousand mangoes versus five thousand mangoes is still a hell of a lot of mangoes, right? And and more that that'll rot before we can eat them. So, so we're less good about big numbers. And it's the same thing between you know a half, a fourth, a qu uh, an eighth, or one in a million, one in ten million, one in a billion. We're, we're less good around there. So here's a this is a very basic study. Uh, the question's easy. In a typical sample of English text, are there more words that begin with K or have K as a third letter? 
and you have your answer. Uh, it turns out there are uh, twice as many words with K as the third letter, even though most people think there are more words with K as the first letter. And this is called the availability heuristic. And basically, it says that we believe that something is more probable the easier it is to bring instances of it to mind. Right? So the easier it is to recall something, the more probable we think it is. It's actually a perfectly reasonable heuristic. Right? If you can remember lots of lion attacks, it's likely they're more common than tiger attacks where you can't remember any of them. So it's a, very, it's a really decent heuristic. It just gets screwed up when you add things like television, right? which plays with that availability. Suddenly, something that is rare, you see much more because you see it on television over and over again. Another experiment that illustrates that, this is the football experiment, uh, another college experiment. It's be before the big game. We'll, uh, we'll get people in a room, fans in a room, divide them in half and, and ask them, uh, you know, you guys, you should visualize your team winning. And, f and visualize what it feels like and how, you know, what'll happen. And you guys will visualize your team losing. And, and so the same thing, visualize it richly and in all the detail. Then we'll ask you, who do you think will win? These guys are more likely to think their team will win than those guys. Right? Because it's easy to recall what winning feels like. Same experiment was done, I think it was a 76 presidential election, which was Carter versus Dole. Right, the, uh, a few days before, to visualize who would win and who would lose. And same thing. There's another heuristic for an availability. It's called vividness. This is an, actually, this is a neat experiment. Uh, we're giving people pieces of evidence in a drunk driving case. And there are two types of evidence. There's pallid evidence and vivid evidence. And half of you, we're going to give pallid evidence for the prosecution and vivid evidence for the defense, and the other half we're going to give vivid evidence to the prosecution and pallid evidence for the defense. And, and so here's a couple pieces of evidence, and you can see the difference. And the first one is, on his way out the door, Sanders, he's a defendant, staggers against a serving table, knocking a bowl to the floor. That is a pallid piece of evidence. The vivid version in is, on his way out the door, Sanders staggers against a serving table, knocking a bowl of guacamole dipped to the floor and splattering guacamole on the white shag carpet. Right? So it's vivid, but not in a way that affects the case, which is whether, whether Sanders was drunk or not. And there's a whole bunch of evidence like this. So we'll give this evidence out, and we'll ask you guys, so to pretend you're the jury, is Sanders innocent or guilty? And I mean, this is actually an interesting experiment. Well, what, what the uh, experimenters found is the pallid versus vivid made no difference in predicting guilt or innocence. But when you brought the people back a week later, and ask them to remember the stuff you heard last week, retry the case in your mind, then it made a huge difference. And the side that had the vivid evidence was more likely to get a verdict on their side. I, I wish I had the percentages with me, but I don't. Yeah, do I? I don't. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other availability heuristics. Uh, the worst memory tends to be the most available. This is actually interesting. An experiment I saw, I think the best one, was done in, uh, in London, where experimenters would go to people on uh, train platforms and say, tell me about a time you were late for the train, and would record the story. And they would ask other people, tell me the worst time you were late for the train. Tell me that story. The stories were very similar. Right? People tended to remember the most extreme example of the thing they're trying to bring to mind. But you can imagine how this will affect security trade-offs and perceptions of risk. When the most extreme thing is the one you think about, whenever you think about the thing. There's a hindsight bias. We all see this. Right? You know, in sports, it's called Monday morning quarterbacking. It says, it, 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 once something has happened, you misremember how much you thought it would happen. Right? When something actually happens, it becomes much more available in your head. And, and people do. I mean, they, they run experiments. They'll ask people about who will win the game tomorrow. And then they'll ask them the next day, after the game is run, who did you think would win the game yesterday? And people misremember what they thought regularly. Right? It happens in politics, it happens in sports, it happens everywhere. There's another probability heuristic. Is this, this is representativeness. Representatives basically says that we tend to think of 
something is more probable based on how well it fits the stereotype, based on how well it fits the model of what we have in our heads. And here's an experiment that, that illustrates this. I, this is a great experiment. Uh, the experimenters give the subjects these basically personality sketches. They're, they're stereotypical sketches. And then ask questions about them. And, and so this is one of them. Right? It's about Linda. And Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright, majoring in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Then you're asked to check off the most likely thing about Linda. And there are like eight of them. Linda is a baker. Linda is a... Oh, I don't know, a, a lawyer, Linda, and they're, they're, all, they're all dummies except for two of them. Linda is a bank teller, and Linda is a bank teller and a active in the feminist movement. Okay? Now, 90% of people surveyed believe that Linda is more likely for Linda to be, to be a feminist bank teller than a bank teller. Now, if any of you know some math, that's actually impossible, right? Because the second one is a subset of the first one. Right? It, by definition, it is more likely that Linda is a bank teller than a feminist bank teller. But what people do is they, they focus on the feminist part, right, which matches the stereotype. They ignore the, the base, the, the, the bank teller part, and that's the kind of answer you get. And you know, there's a bunch of studies that, that show this. It's, it's kind of a neat experiment. You know, and it explains a lot about how stereotypes work in our heads and why they work and why we use them. So let's talk about costs. So now we're moving out of risks, both uh, severity and probability, into costs. Uh, the br brain is really weird about costs. We keep a surprisingly complex set of books in our head. And this also pisses off economists because we're not we're pretty much not rational here. We're not rational anywhere. But we're but this is money, we're supposed to be rational. So here is a here's a basic experiment. Again, we'll divide into two groups. You guys will be given uh, this choice, right? Imagine you've decided to see a play where the ticket costs ten dollars. Now you can see how old this experiment is. Uh, as you enter the theater <laughs> you discover you have it's it's a, it's you discover you lost a ten dollar bill. Would you still pay ten dollars to see the play? Right. Basic, basic, basic economic question, and, and you'll have an answer. You guys will get this other trade-off. Imagine you've decided to see the same play, and as you enter the theater, you've discovered you've lost the ticket. Would you spend $10 for an identical ticket? Now, again, this is the exact same trade-off. Right? In economic terms, would you go see the play and spend $20 for the privilege, or go home having spent $10 for nothing? Right? That's the trade-off in both cases. But you get very different answers. 88% right? of you will, pay, will, will replace, will buy the ticket if they've lost to $10. But less than half of you will replace the ticket. And there's a lot of theories about this. Basically, what this is showing is that you guys have lost $10 out of general funds, so it's kind of okay. But you've lost $10 out of your entertainment budget. So it's harder to justify another $10 for entertainment, well, these guys, you know, hasn't been allocated yet. So it's unallocated general funds. Lots and lots of experiments bear out these weird mental accounting things that we do. And they are weird. But here's another one. Again, this also, this, the, the numbers also date this experiment. Uh, imagine that you're about to purchase a jacket for $125 and a calculator for $15. Right, the calculator salesman informs you that you can buy the same calculator for $10 20 minutes away. Would you go to the other store? And the other half of you get a similar uh, discussion. You're going to buy a jacket for $15 and a calculator for $125. Right, the calculator salesman informs you that you can get the same calculator for $120 20 minutes away. Would you drive to the other store? Again, it, it's really the same question, right? Would you drive 20 minutes to save $5? In both cases, that's the same question. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this doesn't matter. I have, you know, I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I get it's a joke, but it's actually, it's, it's an important question to ask is, are there gender biases here? Are there cultural biases here? Yeah, and, and while I'm less sure about cultural biases, a lot of these are American experiments or European experiments. 
Uh, there's pretty much no gender bias in any of this stuff. That, that men and women react the same to these trade-offs. But basically, about two-thirds of you would be willing to drive 20 minutes to save $5 off a $15 item, basically save 33%. But, only, but about a quarter of you, or between a quarter and a third, will, will drive to save $5 off of a $125 item. Right? So the amount of the actual item matters, not the dollar amount saved, which is basically irrational. But that's how we think. And there's another example of mental accounting. Uh, there's kind of weird time discounting. Economics likes to think of us as having sort of a mental interest rate in our heads, and, and we tend to calculate things based on that. So, you know, and a lot of experiments are done. Uh, it, again? All right, my, my cell phone is off. There you go. Right, so there's this sort of mental interest rate. And if you're asked whether you'd like money now or money in a year, you'll have that mental interest rate in your head and you'll do, you'll do the calculation and you'll make the trade-off. And we're all pretty rational about it. I mean, there's some normal curve about you know, how it works, but, but basically we're rational. It turns out we're not. We, we have something called hyperbolic time discounting in our head. Way more complex. So people are indifferent to, and you can do this in surveys, $15 today versus $60 in 12 months. Right, which, 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 which implies uh, a rate of 139%. We're at the same time indifferent to $250 today and $350 in 12 months, or $3,000 today and $4,000 in 12 months. Very different rates. You frame it in terms of a, of, a, uh, of a delay, you get different answers. So we're giving you $60 in 12 months. How much less do you want to get it now? Right, you phrase it that way, and you get very different answers. You, you phrase it in terms of a loss. You're going to lose $60 in 12 months. How much would you lose today you know, not to have to deal with it? You get different answers. We have extremely complex time discounting, which makes a lot of... I mean, and you, know, you can take advantage of it. Right? If you are a bank, you, know, you can jigger your interest rates to take advantage to our, our, mental, uh, our mental models. You don't have to, may not have to offer as much or phrase the way the uh, plan works differently. This explains Christmas clubs, by the way. I don't know if people remember Christmas clubs. They were around when I was a kid. And basically, the bank would take $100 from you every month and at Christmas time give you $1,200. And this was considered a deal. <laughs> but it was phrased in such a way that, that people didn't think of the interest. Uh, there are other decision-making heuristics. There's a, there's a context effect. We tend to make uh, trade-offs based on, on context. There's a study done. What, what was it? You, you were asked to imagine that, again, we divide you into two groups, and you're asked to imagine you're sitting on a beach in a hot summer day, and your friend says, hey, I'm going to go over and buy a beer for you. How, how much do you want me to spend on your beer? And if he said, I was going to go over to that uh, you know, cheap bodega over there and buy you a beer, you'd, you'd have a price. You guys would have the same experiment, but, but the friend would say, I'm going to go over there that, to that expensive resort and buy you a beer. Now, in economic terms, the value of a beer on a hot summer day is a fixed number to you. But actually, it's not, because these guys will be willing to spend much less on the beer than you guys will. So just the context of expensive resort versus chief bodega changes your mental value of what that beer is. Right? There's uh, choice bracketing. Anybody who's uh, given decisions to their boss knows how to do this. If you want your boss to choose the one decision you want, you give them three choices and put yours in the middle. Right? That actually does work. Uh, it is also shows up in, uh, in how we look at... Uh, Choices that happen one at a time versus all at once. It's kind of a neat experiment done. Uh, again, this is another class, and we'll add, tell you guys, we'll tell all of you, I, as the professor, I'm going to bring in snacks for you every morning for the next three weeks. So you guys tell me which snacks you want. And here's a list of snacks, and you'll pick one. You'll, you know, you'll pick the one you want the first week, the second week, and the third week. And you'll give me the list, and I'll bring them in the next three weeks. You guys... What we're going to do is, I'll bring in a bunch of snacks, and you tell me what you want each morning. These guys tend to pick a variety of snacks, where you guys basically take your favorite each week. So when we make decisions in bulk, we tend to overestimate our need for variety. 
Whereas when we make them at the spur of the moment, we just take what we want. Another example of choice bracketing. Uh, okay, the anchoring effect. This is uh, this this one. This one just piss you off. I mean, if you have any 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 hope of believing that the brain's rational, I will now dash it. Uh, in this experiment, as there's a bunch of experiments. This is my favorite of the example of this. We're going to put you yeah, one at a time in front of a roulette wheel, and we're going to spin it, numbered one through a hundred, and a random number will come up, and you will see the random number. You'll see the roulette wheel spin, you'll see the random number. And we'll ask you, is the number of African nations in the UN greater or less than that number? Okay? It doesn't matter what the question is. It's a question actually you don't know the answer to, you're going to have to estimate. That's the whole point of the question. And you'll tell me, you know, it's more or less. Whatever, you make it up. And then I'll ask you, okay, how many nations do you think are in, African nations think are in the UN? And you'll tell me. Turns out the higher number you see, the higher number you guess. Even though the number is random, even though you see it random. Right? And, and what's hypothesized is what we do is our brain anchors on this number because it's there. And we sort of, you know, interpolate up or down from it. Oh, it's probably less than that, maybe by 10. Or I think it's more than that. But it's still centered around the number you see. I mean, this has bizarre implications. I mean, you just hand people random data and they start fixating on it. Even though they know it's random. Even though it might not be true. Even though they, might, they know it's not true. All right. One last example of the anchor, anchoring effect. So again, divided two groups and this will give you a survey question. Should divorce in this country be easier to obtain, more difficult to obtain, or stay the same? And we'll ask you guys and you'll tell me. And we'll ask you guys a very similar question. Should divorce in this country be easier to obtain, stay the same, or be more difficult to obtain? And it turns out, right, given the very complex question of how easy divorce should be in this country, people tend to prefer the last thing I tell you. That just by going last, you get a bump. Now this, does, now, you know, this doesn't even feel like a leading question. I mean, you hear about push polling, you hear about leading polling questions. This doesn't feel like one, but it is. Right? If just by putting the option you want last, you get a bump. All right, so what does this all mean? God, it means people are a mess. Anyway, it means a few things. It means that if we're looking for, you know, rationality is a bad word. If we're looking for computer-like calculations in people, we're wasting our time. We're not going to get it. And in some ways, it's a fallacy to expect it. Because people don't, don't act that way. Right? It means that, that people have very fine-tuned perceptions of, of risk and costs and the, and, and the way we deal with decisions. But they're based on these sorts of heuristics. Right? And, and in some ways, there's sort of the good way and the evil way of taking this research. Right? The good way is, let's understand these brain biases so we can learn to overcome them and make more rational decisions. The evil way is, let's understand these brain biases so we can exploit them, right, and make people make the decisions we want them to. And you do see the evil way more and more in advertising, in politics, in, in, in fields of persuasion. And there's a great book which I'll recommend called Persuasion, which talks about a lot of this stuff. You know, for, for years I was writing about sort of the evils of security theater. Right, security that, uh, that looks good and doesn't do anything. You know, what, what this research really shows is security theater has a place. That making people feel secure is valuable. And the problem isn't when uh, we have security that looks good and doesn't do any good, when we have security theater. The problem is when security reality and security perception go out of whack. Right, we kind of, we want them to be aligned. We want people to feel as secure as they are, no more, no less. Right? And when you have people more secure than they are, you need some theater to get it up there. Right? When you have people less secure than they feel, you need less security theater to get them down to the reality. Right? You, 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 need, you need to know where people stand. 
So I think we as a community need to spend a lot more time on how people perceive security, especially when we're designing products. Right? You know, and, and it's simple stuff. It's it's you know putting the little green uh, lock in the bottom left corner of our browser that makes people feel secure. Well, what are we actually telling them? We're giving them a feeling of security, but we have no con they have no context for it. So they think it's a magic. When in fact, that meant one very specific thing about how SSL was working. And it didn't mean the big thing people took it to mean. So when you're looking at user interface or even how people just interact with security in the whole, I think it's real important to start looking at some of these cognitive biases. There's, there's a couple of other books I want to mention. There's a really good book, not really about security, but it, it does touch on a lot of these topics. The book is called Stumbling on Happiness. Has anyone heard of this book? Okay, good. You're in for a treat. The book is by someone named Daniel Gilbert. And he asks a question, which I think is, is a, it's kind of an amazingly basic question as soon as I explain it to you, but you've never thought of it before. The question is this. We spend a lot of time trying to make our future selves happy, right? Getting, going to the right school, getting the right job, marrying the right person, living in the right city, buying the right car. Our future selves spend a lot of time cursing our past selves for getting it so wrong. <laughs> right, getting the wrong job, buying the wrong person, buying the damn TV. Why is it that we are such poor predictors of what will make us happy, you'd think we'd be good at it? Right, that's actually interesting. It's, and that's what the book's about. Uh, the other book uh, I'd, I'd like to recommend, it's, 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 a little, it's, a, it's a little heavier read, but it's well worth reading. The book is called Moral Minds. And uh, what the author does is he's trying to study the, uh, basically the evolutionary origins of morality. And he has a very Chomskyan theory, like, as Chomsky does for language, uh, on how morals work. And he does great things like he, uh, you know, there was, a, there was this long-standing debate during the Enlightenment between uh, Kant and Hume about how morals happened. And I'm forgetting who. One of them said that we would reason first and, then mo and moralize afterwards. Then they said, no, no, it's backwards. We would moralize first and then we would basically justify it, right? So what the author of this book does is he throws people under MRI scanners, asks them moral questions, and see which parts of the brain light up in what order. But I, I love this, that you know, hundreds of year old philosophical dilemmas are being solved through brain scanning. And the book talks about morals and how we deal with morals. Really interesting book. So that's the basic talk. A lot of what I've said here uh, with lots of references is uh, at this URL. And there, both sides. And I, I, I sort of urge you to, uh, to go look if you want to read more of this. Some of the studies are just fascinating. And also, I have a... I have a put it back? I, I, I've, I've elided a lot of the details in the studies. Because often you, you read the summary and say, oh, that's not right because they didn't control for this or, or, or this will happen or, you know, there's a way, it doesn't work that way. Usually the studies are much better designed than you imagine when you first read them. And when you start reading the papers, you really see how well they're designed to control for all the external variables. But this is all really good stuff. And I, I think it's fascinating. I'm, I'm really still reading it. Uh, we hope to have a workshop in this, in psychology and security, we actually get the computer security people together with the uh, psychologists and the philosophers and the brain scanners. And because I think we have a lot to teach each other. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. I have about, I think, five, ten minutes. So I see a microphone there, and there might be others I don't see. And hopefully your microphone's better than mine. But some of you are running out. Anyway.